afternoon everyone and or good morning to some of you in fact and welcome to our webinar presentation this afternoon or this morning. Uh, our group is very proud uh, to announce our presentation today will be covering the New Zealand Transport Agency's position statement on ITS systems responding to the opportunities. We're excited to have a guest presenter today from the NZTA but before I introduce him and he is in fact Neil Brown. Uh, I'd like to introduce David Green of our group who is here today to provide some special comments as well as an, an introduction. Uh, so that's Neil there and we'll talk a little bit to Neil and we'll get him to introduce himself in just a moment. Now David Green as I said is a member of our uh, or he's a senior engineer from our network operations group here at ARB and I'll get David to do a little bit of an introduction on himself and tell us a little bit perhaps about why we're excited that Neil's joining us today and a little bit about his presentation. Uh, we are recording today's webinar presentation as per usual so don't worry too much about taking notes, please just listen and you can review the materials at a later time. If you'd like to ask our presenters some questions or in fact make some comments along the way, please don't be shy. We very much welcome and encourage the discussion. So please uh, pop any questions into that questions box and send them on through. Now David, tell us a little bit about you for those of uh, our audience who are unfamiliar with, uh, with you and your work. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks Angela. Um, well, as Angela said, my name's Dave Green. I'm a civil engineer and a I've been a civil engineer in the transport industry for, for over 10 years across both private and, and public sectors and currently I'm a senior engineer in the ARB group in the, in the networks operations team and this role has me participating in various research projects investigating methods to improve transport outcomes to all road users. And so in recent times uh, I've been involved in the Australia's Cooperative ITS program which is investigating and establishing the establishment of a local framework to enable wireless communications between vehicles and between vehicles and roadside infrastructure and the back office. And so this involvement has, has seen me um, or has seen me experience um, the evolution of information communication and technology evolving rapidly over, over recent years and, and playing more of a role in the management of, of road transport. And so with the potential benefit of enabling ICT in the management of, of transport, the evolving nature of ICT has seen a need for road agencies to, to review and update their ITS architecture and master plans uh, to reflect this with various road agencies at, at various stages of, of updating and, and reviewing their plans on ITS. And so in April 2014, the New Zealand, New Zealand Transport Agency uh, released its position statement on intelligent transport systems, which recognises the need to, to use ICT to, do, to deliver enhanced outcomes to, to all, all transport users and operators. And so I was fortunate enough to, to hear Neil Brown present an overview of this position statement uh, to the Austro's Cooperative ITS Steering Committee at a recent meeting and as an outcome of, of hearing him speak, it was felt that it, it presents a refreshing insight into ITS and provides a simple yet powerful framework to understand and respond to the implications and opportunities that ITS offers uh, to, to road users, oh, to road agencies. And so as such, um, AWRB has invited Neil Brown to present today's webinar in order to provide an overview of the position statement to a wider audience in a hope that the knowledge and experience of NCTA can be passed on to other road agencies and industry members and can be used to assist them in preparing and, and updating their own ITS um, architectures and, and master plans. So without any more further ado, I'll pass over the presentation to Neil who can provide a, an overview of NZT, NZTA's um, ITS position statement. Thank you. 
Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just giving you control of your screen there so that you can move on with your presentation. And of course, I'm sure many of the audience would remember David Green as well, as um, this certainly isn't his first webinar. David's been involved with uh, many ITS projects and uh, many of these have been shared with our audience via webinar. So uh, thank you, David, for your time and over to you, Neil. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for that kind introduction, Angela and David. Um, yes, indeed, I'm based down here in New Zealand, as you can tell from my accent that I haven't been in New Zealand all of my life. Um, I emigrated about 15 years ago now, um, and I've spent most of my time over here in New Zealand leading um, architectural groups in ICT uh, across government. Um, so my my foundation core skill sets um, are in architecture and ICT, but um, in enterprise architecture predominantly these days. Um, and when I joined into TA about um, two two years ago now, I was asked um, pretty quickly to um, take in hand the whole area of ITS. And what I would like to share um, and with you today is as much um, the journey of how we went about addressing ITS as an organization um, and the process that we, we took to arrive at the paper that David um, mentioned earlier. Um, but before I get into that in um, any more detail, um, the organization, um, Transport Agency, um, perhaps some of you are aware of it, um, there are a number of different organizations in the transport space in government and they all have slightly different um, focus. Um, as an agency, we're predominantly an investor and it is very important to reflect on that in that that colors very much how we approach and how we see ITS um, in terms of its um, importance to us and we invest in network infrastructure, public transport and regulate its use in New Zealand. Um, we do this through partnering and collaboration um, and essentially outsource um, uh, out to contractors, maintenance and operation and the delivery of those road assets. And with local partners we manage traffic um, in urban areas on the state highways and local roads. We're also, and this I have found in my two years here to be a very important factor, a very federated organization um, with people displaced in many offices across the country. And um, that also has a huge bearing in the approach that we've taken and some of the issues we face. But around about 18 months ago, um, we sort of sat down and we realized from an ITS point of view, we um, we didn't really know what we were about when it came to ITS. We had a number of questions that we didn't have very good answers for. Um, and those included um, big ones, such as, what is the problem we're trying to solve with ITS? Do we even know what ITS means as an organization? Do we have a common definition? The board um, above the transport agency was suspecting that the country may be in risk of missing out on some incredibly important ITS advantage that, that might be being seen elsewhere around the world. Um, we didn't know what our role as an agency was with regard to ITS. It being relatively new um, um, and, and essentially implicating some responsibilities that hadn't been factored in at the day one when the agency was created. Um, so Without knowing all of this, without having a clear idea of what ITS was an organization 18 months ago, we didn't feel that we were particularly performing very well. We certainly were in no place to lead the sector here in, in New Zealand in the way that we would have, would have wanted. Um, and we certainly couldn't think about investing proactively because we could never be sure enough to be able to write those checks. Um, so we developed um, what you see in front of you is a, is a very high level meta process um, for trying to get our act together, essentially. And I called it the walkabout with the deference to a 1970s film starring Jenny Agatha, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, but it was a, a sort of high-level process. And it, it, it forms two parts. And you can see where we currently think we are, but essentially the, there's the upfront strategic piece to IGS, understanding what it meant to us as an organization, trying to get our, ha hand, our heads around it. Um, and, and aligning it to our strategy, understanding what the benefits were and what our role was. And then we've moved more into a BAU mode, essentially, having got over that hump that we could 
get more into a business as usual, um, essentially um, keep an eye on ITS new developments and execute. So that was the, the high level walkabout plan. So step one was um, to agree as an organization what the common definition was. We had a number of different pockets um, who were focused in particular areas, be it maintaining or operating or building roads, and each one of those groups would have quite a different perspective on what they thought ITS meant. It was often a very siloed, siloed view. <coughs> it was often a very mode-centric view. So we went hunting for a definition um, that encapsulated a, a mode agnostic uh, and a benefits-driven kind of feel. Uh, and we came up with this one. and. Um, I won't say it was arbitrary, um, but this one uh, ticked the boxes, and the important thing for us was we shared the same definition, um, and we were all happy to um, huddle under this one. But without that, we couldn't really start to have very productive uh, conversations as an organization. So, um, I mean, the whole process is about answering questions. So coming up with questions, as I was asked to do by David, um, for your good selves um, to perhaps stimulate some thought locally in your own organizations was very easy. Um, but the first ones that come to mind is, do you as an organization share a common definition, either internally or perhaps with a wider sector? Is it an open one? And, and does it emphasize the solution or does it emphasize the benefits? And that's, that's maybe something you guys can, can think about. And I hope to be able to uh, respond to any messages that come up, but uh, forgive me if I'm a little slow at doing that. Um, I'll give it my best shot. Um, so the definition uh, as a high level got us quite a long way down the road. Um, we could start to have productive conversations, but then we realized we needed a slightly more granular view of ITS uh, to parcelate it, to, to, to categorize it into some useful chunks um, that actually reflected particular interests of, of individuals within the organization so that we could work in parallel um, but work under a common hood. And again, this particular subdivision that you see is, is one such. I have seen quite a few um, in a relatively short period of time. Um, the important thing for us was that we, we agree this one and, and stick to it. Um, and the categories are, there's no rocket science with these, but um, there are a couple of interesting twists to them. Vehicles, vehicle-based stuff. This cooperative, which was vehicles talking to vehicles or vehicles talking to infrastructure. User-related is an investment made by our users, the general public. This is the investment focus I mentioned earlier. What are they buying? What are they investing in? Um, completely apropos anything we might be thinking. Um, and yes, it's not just smartphones, but it includes things like smartphones. Then there's roadside asset. That's perhaps the oldest um, category there ever was when it comes to ITS. I think it's arguable. Um, but uh, th there's the roadside side of things, um, variable message signs, etc. Back office for us is very much the traffic management side of things. Those ICT systems that are used to manage the roadside and the uh, the real time um, operations of the traffic on the roads. And the last category was was industry related. So that breakdown we know isn't perfect, and we uh, we suspect we might be adding to it at some point in the future. But the important thing was to get a consensus um, so that we could promote a dialogue within an organization. We weren't talking at, at odds. Um, one of the things that this immediately brought to light for us as an organization was that there were different solutions in these categories, in different categories, that were competing for the same benefits. This will lead on to a later, later question for you guys, but we definitely didn't want to be solution driven. We wanted to be benefits led. This is um, an underlying principle we have as an organization. We don't always walk that walk, um, but we try manfully to do so. And the next stage of the walkabout and the process was to to make sure that, that whatever our view was and vision was regarding ITS, it was grounded very closely with our strategy. There was a strong suspicion that people see shiny thing and go running off um, in a Homer Simpson like way um, in, into the fields. As an organization, we invest in those things that relate and promote our strategic objectives. So the natural um, day one workshop that, that we had 18, two, well, 20 months ago now 
was with members around the organization and we had the business objectives of the organization down the left hand side of the piece of paper and we started to have the conversation what can ITS do to help us realize these business objectives there may be lots of very exciting things out there but if we couldn't relate it to one of our business objectives then we weren't to get too excited about it there was the possibility that we come up with something strategically earth-shattering that required us to revisit the business strategy of the organization. And I do not say that isn't, isn't the case, but as, as it was, the way we had drawn our business objectives, we were able to essentially accommodate pretty much all the advantages that ITS had. And what you see on the screen is just one small little corner of a much bigger frame, framework where we had all the business objectives. So you see one business objective, and we we were thinking about ITS in relation to what benefits it could could achieve against that objective. In this case, it was to do the safe system approach, um, removing human error and vulnerability on the roads. Obviously, reduction in death and serious injury was was a benefit. Increased compliance with safe speeds, we thought was not not going into the how, but sticking to the what benefit. And we also thought it would allow better targeted investments for achieving a safe system. The last one being very interesting in that um, there are different ways of achieving that. Um, one being to cotton wall the roads, which is very expensive, um, putting in um, collapsible um, lampposts and barriers, etc. And the other, of course, is smart cars that can't hit things anymore. And obviously one is very much a long game. Um, but there's clearly um, uh, an opportunity to perhaps move from investing in one side to the other at some point in the future. So those are the benefits and then we had the conversation about how ITS can achieve those benefits. Uh, we made sure we had metrics to be able to measure the benefits too, that's a very important element. Um, the how then led to the right, so what investment needs to be to be made to make those those things happen, and in what areas, um, and there was the nature of that investment. In in some cases, we didn't think very much investment was required. In others, it was a strategic amount, and we wanted to document that. And then the final piece of this sort of a big framework um, was to identify what is our particular role with regard to those investments. Now, in some cases, we identified benefits that would occur without us having to lift a finger, um, and the cost and the investment would fall off the car as it rolls off the forecourt. Um, but it was different in each case, and we had to go through the whole matrix to complete the story, and it was many workshops. Um, but that ensured we were grounded demonstrably to our business strategies and organization. And I don't know about your individual organizations, but for us, that was um, that was very much rolling out the red carpet in terms of, great, well done, I'm impressed, move forward. Um, and if we hadn't been able to do that, we may have had some serious, um, serious roadblocks to what we were doing. So that leads to the second of, of the questions that I thought might be germane. Um, does your organization and how does it ensure that the ITS investments that you're making are aligned to strategy and not simply a response to the latest sexy gadget, which was true in some cases for us for sure, but um, that's something maybe you guys um, would like to think about. Thank you, Neil. What we might do is, um, if you wouldn't mind, pop it back to that question slide and we'll just leave it open for the audience for a moment to, to get them thinking about it and perhaps to type some uh, responses through and uh, give you a, a moment to have a, a drink of water, Neil, as I'm sure you're parched. Um, David, at this point, do you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to add a bit further from what Neil, Neil has been presenting so far in that it's important for road agencies to, to go back to the problem or to define transport strategy or, or outcome that the road agency wants to, to achieve and, and seek out solutions to, to that problem or that strategy rather than um, having a solution and then trying to justify its implementation or by trying to find a, find a problem in order to, to justify um, its implementation. Uh, and then while, I guess, um, participants are, are responding to, to the question up, up on their screen at the moment, it might be important just to, to go back to what Neil was 
saying earlier and, and some of the questions that, that he that he raised following the um, his presentation on his on NZTA's, NZTA's um, definition of ITS. And so if we if we recap what he what he said earlier, um, NZTA's definition on ITS is that intelligent transport systems apply information and communication technologies that support and optimise all modes of transport by cost effectively improving how they work both individually and in cooperation with one another. And then he asked some questions around does your organisation share a common de definition, is it open and does it emphasise the solution or the benefits? So we'll be interested in, in hearing what uh, webinar participate, participants um, responses to those questions are. And, and, in, and with respect to them, um, I was just going to add that it's important for road agencies to be technology or solution agnostic in their view on ITS. And but further on this, that ITS should also be able to encompass both the concept of, of ITS being used to identify transport problems, um, but all, to also be used to provide opportunities for um, ITS to provide enhanced transport solutions to not yet identified problems. So it should be both as a way of um, addressing identified problems, but also to be able to provide opportunities and enhanced outcomes to not yet um, necessarily identified problems. Thank you for that, David. We do have a bit of a quiet audience, but we do have a, a little question there from Jeff. And um, just while we take a moment to um, consider that, I'd uh, like to reiterate that we are, of course, recording today's session and all of you will have access to the presentation material as well as the recording uh, in case you'd like to review it at a later time or perhaps share it with your friends and, and colleagues. So, yeah, uh, so... Um, can I... Sorry, Neil? Can I, can I respond to the question I've, I've um, been put here? The question, um, would it be important to assess previous ITS investments to work out whether they were a valuable investment or not? Um, I think the answer to that is a, a resounding yes um, in, in, a, in a lessons learned um, way. Um, and I, I can definitely say from the transport agency perspective, there were occasions when we perhaps invested in um, blind alleys um, or cul-de-sacs. Um, clearly though with ITS, with, with quite a lot of um, the investment that's done, it's in a kind of R&D, trying things out kind of kind of way. I think the area that uh, sticks out there for me would be in um, anything to, to do with identifying real-time flow of traffic on roads. Um, and there are a number of different ways of doing that. And we have invested in, in small little pilot projects um, particular stretches of the road to see what works well and what doesn't. Um, and so that would very much be um, a, a yes to the answer as a, as a response to that question. Um, and some of them haven't been, you know, great. Or some of them have been, um, should we say, trumped by, by later technology that, that provides an even better way of achieving the same thing. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, Andrew Summers um, also has um, written in more of a comment than, than a question, and, and it's just outlined that, that Western Australia's ITS master plan um, which is currently in draft, um, has a four-layer approach where the first layer is organisation 2020 strategy plus transport policy and strategy, and the second layer is a strategic vision for ITS, and the third layer is a focus area for ITS, and the fourth layer is specific ITS actions then showing progress leading towards the outcome. So in, in that approach, um, Andrew Summers thinks it's quite similar in, in many senses to, to what um, NZTA is uh, proposing. And, and I would just add that um, I, I, this was not conscious uh, on my part, because I was on it, this sort of came up with a framework, but um, I realized in retrospect that it was uh, really quite similar to um, investment logic mapping structure. Um, I think that would be a perfectly reasonable way of, of doing it as well. Um, it, it's, it's a way of doing it. I think the, the important thing to focus on in both organizations is that it's done and that you can share that traceability. And um, uh, yeah, so um, this it, is by no means the, the, the gospel according to. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it will stimulate some ideas and, and perhaps some suggestions of, of, of how we could even do it better. That would be quite nice as well. So, 
Right. Well, thank you, Andrew, for that comment. And, and of course, we welcome everyone's uh, questions, feedbacks, comments along the way. So please don't be shy. And on that note, Neil, I might just let you uh, get back to your presentation then. We look forward to hearing about the next part. Okay. I thought you, thought you were going to say let, let you loose again. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the next um, uh, part of, of the story and the, the, the walkabout that we, we had to, to uh, execute was to make sure that we knew w what the benefits were from a New Zealand point of view. Um, this was very much part of the board conversation, um, and these are the general themes that, that are particularly relevant in New Zealand right now, to which ITS has a particular bearing. I've mentioned the, the safer journeys aspect of things, both from a safety but also from an investment perspective. Um, smarter choices. Uh, w w one of the things I didn't mention earlier about that um, multimodal, mode agnostic definition, that it is easy for an organization like us where most of the money is spent on, um, on building roads to forget that we're meant to be land transport and the, the, the other modes sometimes feel a bit undernourished um, and unloved. Um, and actually ITS perhaps plays strongest at the intersection between modes is is a thought that, that you might want to, 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 to juggle with. Um, but smart choices from a consumer point of view in terms of w which modes they ch take, where they live as well, and where they p place their businesses, and better journey experiences all around with modes much more uh, interoperating with one another, um, synergized and um, achieves using ITS smarts um, was a big one. Obviously, compliance, greater convenience um, from a, a paying and a licensing and a you know not speeding perspective. This this is this is a, a reasonable, reasonably high profile issue for New Zealand. The the investment side of things um, is huge. So better information about what's going on in the network provided through ITS means informing better investment decisions. Given the dollars involved, um, that kind of trumps pretty much most conversations around here. Um, you know, a, a one or two percent difference on, on some of those numbers is a, a yikes moment. And uh, um, why the hell are we hanging around? Why not get on with it? Kind of conversation. So that's a big one. Fair insurance. Um, we had an open day um, um, here in New Zealand in Wellington and in, in Auckland. And um, insurance companies actually expressed an interest in, in wanting to attend. Um, so it was out to the wider sector, um, and I was quite surprised by that initially. And then, uh, then it was pointed out to, to my blissful ignorance how, how relevant this was to insurance as well, um, in terms of identifying specific driver behaviour and impacting you know, premiums, etc. Uh, economic stimulation, yeah, obviously removing risk from um, supply chain um, side of things. Better business decisions about where to place depots. Um, is key, um, and I think there was a, a broader, improved brand New Zealand thing as well in terms of um, if we could be seen as being globally ITS friendly. Um, I think I think that's an underestimated one, but I I suspect that might be quite important. Um, so that was from a New Zealand point of view, and from from our own internal point of view. As I say, we we had an alignment to our strategy, but but it, from a functional point of view, um, there really was hardly no part of our business that that didn't look like it would enjoy some benefits from ITS, and this all helped to um, solidify the idea in people's heads that ITS was strategically damn important, um, and not just some kind of um, shiny toy thing around the periphery. But this stuff was fundamentally going to change and positively impact how we did things and how successful we were as an organization over the next 10, 15 years. And um, that's almost um, it's surprising how, how successful we have been at, at getting that across. Um, and now, of course, it's kind of a two-edged sword because now the board are extremely interested in every single thing that we do on ITS and uh, that takes up quite a lot of communications time. But that's, you know, I think that's a problem I like, I'd like to have. Um, but yeah, obviously ITS in, in relation to traffic management, um, we knew there were huge opportunities there around investment, regulation, compliance. Um, from our perspective rather from the end consumer's perspective. Um, and uh, as I say, there wasn't a single one of our long-term goals that wasn't benefited by that and we can demonstrate that. So um, what you have 
now on the screen going down to the next level granularity tool talking about specific benefits and I, and I hope this is this is readable to you guys um, it is in the actual um, strategic paper itself um, but this wheel um, summarized to us where those benefits lay and what was driving them and the interesting thing we found was how improvements to information and driven by ITS intersected every single thing that we did and that as a result the opportunity of ITS to improve information should be one of our major peaks in our mountain range of, of ITS investments purely because of how many things it touched um, better information driving real-time traffic decisions better information driving investment decisions I've told you how important that one is to us better information driving um, improved traveler decisions on the roads um, and better information making people safe on the roads <clears throat> This isn't to say those other areas aren't also key in terms of improved vehicles and autonomous vehicles, etc. Uh, and that the network assets itself and the ITS roadside wasn't important. But information, I drew it as half the circle, and there was a reason for that. Um, it maybe your organisations would do something similar and perhaps come on with a slightly different arraignment. Um, I would be surprised if information didn't straddle lots of things like like us too. Um, and because information is one step removed from the, the shiny metal that is ITS, sometimes it's, it's, it gets forgotten. But um, I think that's probably strategically the, the, the greatest thing that it brings to the table. So uh, that leads us to the next tranche of, of, of questions. And um, w one of the things I think I've um, intimated already is this overlapping um, benefits problem. Um, it's quite a nice problem in that if there are many ways of achieving the same end, that's not a bad place to be, so long as those different value propositions recognize the existence of the other. Um, if, for instance, you were going to claim that um, there are going to be X number of deaths saved on the roads through vehicle-to-vehicle um, -vehicle communication, then are you factoring into that case that autonomous vehicles are also going to be on the road saving, rain de uh, saving deaths at the same time and will be eating some of that value proposition? There are a number of those. Um, intersections and uh, I think it's very important for individual business cases that they, they fairly reflect the, the whole landscape. But is your organization clear on benefits that ITS enables? Sure they are, but um, I, I would ask the question. Um, do you agree, like, like we do, that information seems to be bloody important? Um, do you agree that there is sometimes more than one way of achieving the same benefits? And how are you managing that whole overlapping value proposition? Or do you not see that as, as a challenge that, that, that we do? Angela. Thank you, Neil. I'll leave that open and uh, let our audience out there uh, get some responses through. Um, hopefully they won't be shy this time and will flood us with some um, thoughts and feedback on that one. And we do have a question that's sort of come through and I'll let David ask that one. David, over to you. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, Angela. Um, we've got a question here. Um, it says, though you might see the iPhone as being uh, sexy, do you see its use growing at a higher level, e.g. at the moment? It can, it can show road users where spots are busy and also give routes to, to choose from. Also, how, how does it how does it suggest route one to a user instead of route two? Okay, I, I'll take that as two separate questions. Um, do I see iPhones as sexy tools? <laughs> um, I, I, we, we personally think the mobile phone um, is a complete game changer. Um, and it's it ticks a lot of our boxes from, um, we're about to come onto a slide that shows our principles that we talk about traveler centric and mode agnostic again. Um, and the fact that the phone goes with the traveler um, and is by, by its nature mode agnostic is, is a great deal 
to love about it about about that and um the fact that it's both um, the, the means of getting information to a traveller and getting information from a traveller, there's a great deal to love about it as well. Um, and the fact that they're incredibly ubiquitous in a very short space of time, and I think abiding, I don't have the best crystal ball in the world, but my crystal ball tells me that you will have perhaps different ways of achieving more or less the same thing that go with individuals, but they're here for a long time as well. So. Yes, sexy as all damn, uh, to answer your first point, and I would say that they can do all of those things and a whole much more besides. Um, the um, I was dragged into a, a, a police thing here in New Zealand, no, not in that sense. Um, uh, there was a project going on at the police, and I was asked for some thoughts and, and feedback um, about um, airbag deployment and automatically phoning um, systems from Ford. and. I did a bit of sort of looking at that. There are apps on the phones right now that can detect whether you're falling through the air, and they can be um, configured to detect um, impacts on you as an individual, regardless of what mode of transport you're in, and then to phone automatically um, who you want to have phoned. And it struck me that that was a far more elegant and, and successful way of achieving the same thing that um, offered more value for citizens. But um, their choice, their investment, um, but those sorts of things you can you can never outguess those, and there are only going to be more of them um, as as the you know the years go by. The the route side of things. So, um, is this route to a traveller? I will assume it's route to a traveller. There are some fantastic um, apps out there now, which are multi multimedia, social media aligned. Uh, multimodal, giving information about all your different options depending on where you are from a GPS point of view, um, and giving you instructions about to get off the train at the next stop and, and to move on to bus, etc. Um, two or three years down the line, that will be just standard. Uh, I'm sure of it. And um, it's to some extent, as, a, as an agency, we've tried to compete with that retail space, and um, that will be one of the areas where I think our role will be changing and, and retrenching back to less of an investor role and more of a regulator, regulator space. So that's my answer to that question. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for that. Um, we've got a couple more questions. We might just take a couple more if you don't mind, Neil. A uh, question here from Paul. Um, Paul is asking, how do we really sell the message that ITS is not just an add-on for road projects? i.e. what can the New Zealand experience tell us about, you know, really integrating ITS into new and existing road projects? Very good question. Um, I was talking with a, a contractor colleague just before this presentation, as it happens, about um, just this. Um, um, and uh, to some extent, the transport agency provides an example of, of, of perhaps some of the pitfalls at the moment, because um, a lot of the decisions regarding ITS investment happen within autonomous major projects for building new roads, and it's quite hard to get at the governance of those decisions and align them, align them to a national approach where you achieve synergies and, and alignment and, and minimize risk and cost. So um, that challenge lies ahead of us, but we know what that challenge is, and uh, it, it, I think it starts and, and, and ends with the word governance um, around these decisions, finding out where those decisions are being made, and saying, well, we need to align these either to standards or to principles or to specific implementation approaches, and um, and, and that's that's the first step of this, you know, elevating and extricating ITS. Um, to, to, to the level, the strategic level that it needs, um, because without that, we'll continue to have a number of siloed approaches to different things, and um, no one benefits. Uh, well, uh, correct, correction: some people benefit, but it wouldn't be the tax. It wouldn't be the taxpayer. So that would be what we would um, probably care most about. Excellent. Okay, well, we've got a, uh, a statement, if you will, from uh, Andrew, and I'll just get David to read that one out. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Angela. Uh, yeah, Andrew Summers just makes a statement and then leads it into a question by, by saying that one of the challenges in the information domain is, is that there is a less direct linkage from the road authority action to the result, as there is often reliance 
on choices and behaviour by road users and in some cases significant inertia to behaviour change. So his question of, as a result of that statement is, do you have any, any suggestions as to how to clearly demonstrate the benefits from the focus on information? Um, and just before you consider that, Neil, uh, Andrew further adds that this isn't to say that information isn't important, just that its contribution to improve travel times, improve reliability, etc., can be far less direct and less certain, creating a challenge for directing investment towards it, albeit generally smaller investment required. So just back to his question, Neil, did you have any, any thoughts on or any suggestions as to how to clearly demonstrate the benefits from the focus on information? Well, um, I, was, I was from an information point of view. Um, you know, we we will have to make business cases um, for individual initiatives. So we've identified some information um, related ITS initiatives, such as. Um, a, a global approach to um, capturing real-time information about traffic on the roads. Okay, um, the idea that we have um, completely different ways, different techniques, um, and different investments at local uh, local uh, jurisdiction just creates a, a whole range of issues and is the most expensive possible way of doing it with the least. Um, a, a good result. So we're looking at a global approach to doing that. Now that business case is predicated on on the fact that um, doing it once for everybody will be l less expensive than this death by a thousand cuts. That's a relatively easy business case to make, I think, with regard to um, the, the current costs or the costs of doing it across the country right now. Um, we're not talking about a, a, new, a new ability. The, the, the need to look at real-time flow uh, is already with us. We just don't do it that well yet. Uh, and we can use the ITS based, um, and I'm talking a crowdsourced approach by the way, um, to, to do that at a global level. And the business case um, for that will obviously include the fact that it's exactly the same information you require from real, real time stacked up historically that's used to inform investment decisions. So you've killed two very large birds with one stone. Um, so that business case, I think, makes itself pretty much um, and very much relates to our own function and our own accountabilities and organization. Um, what happens out there in, on the street is that, that, that customers are, are voting with their own feet. <clears throat> And they understand the importance of information. If it's if it's critical to them, they go seek it out, and that drives the appetites to invest in the retail sector to provide information services for 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 travellers and for businesses. And our role there is is to encourage them to regulate, but probably not to compete. Um, but other organisations, you may have different accountabilities, and so may view that differently. I would expect that to be the case. It's not right or wrong. It's just it is what it is. And I hope I've somewhat answered your question. Thank you very much, Neil. Look, we have received uh, a number of questions come through, but I, I guess in the interest of um, tracking okay with time, we might move on with the presentation for the moment. And um, we welcome everyone whose questions that we unfortunately couldn't answer during the presentation to please touch base with us after the webinar and we'll make sure to get some answers and clarification for you. So thank you, Neil. Back to you. And I would be more than happy to stay on afterwards and, and, and address anything uh, or everything. Um, I've got time to do that, uh, Angela, just want to make that clear. So um, the, the next step in the walkabout in terms of this process um, was we wanted to get a response out to the sector. Um, and we wanted to make certain things you know, really clear. I mean, essentially we were aiming for uh, April this year to get the paper out um, to the ITS Asia Pacific Conference in Auckland. Um, and we, we achieved that. Um, but we knew that sector collaboration was, was essential to being successful. Um, and open sector conversations was the default mode. Um, I would say that everything that I'm sharing today is, is continues to be work in progress. That's one of the joys stroke um, grievances of ITS is the, the darn things changing on you all the time. Um, 
I do think there's reason to believe that um, there's a plateau from a technology point of view <clears throat> that we may have reached. <clears throat> and I don't think I'm trying to be a Pollyanna in saying that. I genuinely, from reason runes, I think that is the case. Um, but it, it will always be work in progress for us. But we identified that for the paper in Auckland, we needed to make clear three particular things. Um, the first was um, benefits and principles, so that the, the sector understood how we understood about ITS and understood what principles were driving the decisions we were going to make, um, that we were very clear on what our role was. Um, we've got more work to do on that. It's sort of a you know, you can go down to as much granularity as you want with that, but essentially if the sector didn't know that we were going to invest in, let's say, retail information services, for instance, then they were disinclined to themselves. Uh, and I don't think that was to anyone's benefit. Um, so making a very clear statement actually encourages investment from the sector sometimes. Um, and the third was a, a clear program of work where we were proactively investing in ITS. And as I say, we couldn't know what that was until we had worked out what the benefits were and what our role was. So to talk about those principles, the, people talk about principles a lot, and I think it's one of those conversations that sometimes get a bit, bit um, um, people can be quite cynical about it. I, all I can say is these are darn important to us, and they have made all the difference in the world. Um, your organizations, I'm sure, will come up um, with a different set of principles, and that is quite correct that you should do so. But having them and sticking to them has, has made a big difference to us. Um, the traveler-centric one is very important to stop people focusing only on roads in, in this organization. Big issue. So you keep saying traveler-centric, and I keep everybody in the room. That's great. Ditto multimodal. Um, we encourage that the, the development investment is, is sector-led by and large. We've got to be solution neutral. I think David mentioned as much himself. And the travel choice was, was the thing that actually governed um, our decisions, not what was convenient to us. When it came to the roles discussion, uh, <coughs> my I think my reflection on, on our experience on our, on our walkabout um, was that how this can get complicated very quickly um, because there are too many dimensions in the room. So this is definitely keep it keep it simple, stupid uh, territory. Um, but a colleague of mine, um, Steve Steve Penman, I think some of you may may know, uh, came up with a, a, the ruse that there was a continuum and that. Um, that there was a, a, a sharp end that was we, we were the investment lead and at the bottom end we were we were a follower and then we worked out what the graduations were in between but that as you go up through the through the roles you assume all the previous ones and um, that's a nice neat little list and it is true that we have some differences by mode sometimes um, but by and large we were able to go through the ITS categories that I mentioned earlier, uh, vehicle, um, uh, CRTS, um, freight, and user, and uh, roadside, etc., and establish what our role was in each of those areas. <coughs> and we've, we've, we've got a few exceptions, but by and large, it kind of fitted with that. And back office, for instance, we're clearly investment lead. That was easy. Some of the others, like um, vehicle, we're not an investment lead. We're a regulator, um, and there are some other areas where we're even less than that. Um, and but that conversation is ongoing, um, and I've got a, a paper to write to the board to clarify and confirm that. Um, it's coming up quite soon. Should be good fun because the board's very intrigued by this conversation. <coughs> so uh, when it comes to the program of work, there are some specific um, investments that we we're promoting, as I say, like peaks in the mountain range above others. We think we have good reasons to as an agency, and I've no doubt through, through different priorities and different benefits you would come up with a, a different set, I'm sure. But it, to be clear on them was, was the useful thing. But this crowdsourced uh, GPS data is just too good to be true, almost. And at the very least, we need to um, take an active hand in trying to prove it or disprove its advantages pronto, um, because it, it ticks so many boxes. Um, so that's a, a key one for us. 
better ways of identifying vehicles. Um, I, I know um, talking with David and others um, how well you guys have actually nailed the, the tolling thing over there. We've got a long way to go here, um, but we're looking at various different you know, chip, plate, plate chipping and other uh, potential ways of achieving that. I personally have no um, um, some prejudice either way. One way across the country is is my mantra, um, but we we've got to work out what what might work work best in New Zealand conditions. Aftermarket devices to smarten up dumb cars. So long term, we see autonomous vehicles <coughs> as being the most strategically influential of all the ITS related stuff that we can currently see. Um, and I think there was an implication in one of the questions earlier about what ways we might be able to influence um, or speed things up in the, in the, in the user um, quadrant here. Well, it is a choice that we could make to subsidize the cost of autonomous vehicles, or more autonomous vehicles, I should say, and make them cheap, or make dumb cars more expensive through our regulatory arm. That is a card we might consider playing. In the meantime, um, aftermarket devices, in terms of at least um, simple things like you know, reversing technology so you don't run over kids in um, in uh, um, driveways. Um, now that's that's um, an interesting one because we had uh, an agency who look after housing in New Zealand called it called unsurprisingly Housing New Zealand, um, who look after a lot of the state-owned properties who wanted to invest many many millions in putting fences up on driveways of state-owned properties. And I think aftermarket devices might, you know, supplied to the vehicles of the owners of those houses might have been a much more cost-effective way to achieve a better result because that would work with whatever drive they're in, not just state-owned properties. It's an interesting, interesting thought. You never know where ITS is going to go because it always kicks off tangentially into other areas, I think. And um, I, I personally enjoy that immensely. Um, having worked across a number of different government agencies, I, I try and bring that into the room if I can. Um, we um, sort of moving along with this, these strategic interventions that we've identified. Um, as I say, we need to clarify the market opportunities so the sector knows where we are and where they are. Uh, I think some of the markets, especially in the retail space, need to be better regulated. We haven't even begun to sort of think about that yet, but there needs to be something in there to to guarantee um, safety and accuracy of information so that you know that. Um, uh, the, the, the users and, 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 and travelers aren't, aren't duped uh, or are in danger in any way. Um, standards and common architecture approach, I've been talking with David uh, a lot about that on the back of the Ostro's work. And I'm, I'm a member of the CITS steering group, um, so I'm particularly interested in that, obviously, with my background. That comes first, in my view, but it's an enormous field, and we have resource challenges, I, I freely admit, here in New Zealand. Um, there's an, an important aspect of, of wanting to align ITS generally to the wider all of government world. Um, again, a lot of work to be done in this space, but there is the implication in some of the things I read in ITS that um, security and data and integration are challenges that have never been experienced before. Um, well, actually they have, and there is an awful lot of standards and um, principles and practice in play in the ICT world that is completely transferable into ITS. and um, and should be leveraged or at least aligned with. And I don't think we always take take that opportunity. Uh, certainly that's true in, in New Zealand, so I, I focus on that. Um, and the last one, I, I can't believe this isn't true of Australia, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get a few comments that it is true. The ability to be able to keep up or keep with the pace of ITS from a regulatory point of view is darn near impossible. Um, uh, and new cars are rolling off the forecourts with abilities that we have not done all the things I think we needed to have done. Um, and I think that's just going to get worse. Um, how to keep ahead from a regulatory point of view and get faster and more agile and more responsive is, is something that we've, we are prioritizing as, a, as an, an area to investigate. So, um, the, the walkabout 
has has not ended. Um, we're still on the journey. We have a pretty clear strategic sort of um, set of initiatives that we want to try and take forward. We know what our priorities are. We've got a reasonable idea of what our roles are now, so we know where we should and should not be proactive. Um, getting that message out throughout our organisation is is uh, work still ahead of us in some ways um, uh, because. Clearly, we've been used to doing certain things for some time, and it'll take a little while to, to um, perhaps change mode. Uh, sector collaboration is key, and we've we've started um, some open home type sessions with the sector, and they've gone really, really well. Um, essentially, you know, an advert, an invitation for the sector to turn up, and we had a sort of show and tell. We had. You know, pictures around the side, and, and a whole bunch of colleagues and myself were there, um, addressing any questions the sector might have. Um, that works really well, and I think they were all pleased to be there. There's the whole, you know, ability to exchange views and um, hook up with other people in the sector. So that that's a that that was a nice trick. Um, but we, we remain true to this, this, this thought that ITS is the means to an end and not the end itself. And we, we probably have to remind ourselves about that constantly. But um, I think by and large we're staying true to that. And um, I can only recommend that as being probably the most important thought, thought of all of the presentation I've given here today. Um, so I believe we can make the actual paper itself available via the, via the link at the bottom. I hope that that will work for you guys. Um, and that was all I had to bring today. And I hope you enjoyed that. And I'm here to answer any further questions you might have. Over, over to you, Angela. Neil, thank you so much for your time. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm sure all of our audience will agree. Um, we don't have too much time, but I we received a, a question here from Paul, and I, I'd really like you to try and answer this one before we finish up today, because I think it's a great one that's on everyone's mind. He asks, what is the one key message that all other road authorities should learn from the New Zealand experience? Neil, over to you. Align IT, ITS investments to your benefits and strategic objectives. If you can't do that, then there's a problem. Okay. Um, I, thought that question, I thought that question might be going in another direction, <laughs> but it didn't. No, no. All right. Um, we might just hand back over to us yep. um, just to conclude the webinar with a couple of um, thank yous. So thank you, Neil, for your time today. We very much appreciate your time because we appreciate it's very precious, in fact. And um, just to conclude, I guess we'll um, finish up on our, um, on our slide here. So I'll just maximise that one. David? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, thank you Angela and um, yeah, thank you Neil. Um, I hope you all found that um, informative and, um, uh, and I hope it can assist you in developing your own ITS architectures and, and master plans for your own road agencies. And so if you want, any, if you want further details on the, on the New Zealand Transport Agency ITS position statement, it can be found on their website, which is on their screen, and just uh, put in the search for yeah, um, ITS position statement and, and you'll be able to find a link there. And if you want some further information from, from Neil Brown on, on the presentations today, if you, if you want to start a, a dialogue for some of the questions that we weren't able to, to, to get around to answering today, then uh, feel free to contact Neil Brown on, on the details up on, up on your screen or contact myself on, on the details um, up on your screen as well. And if you want further information on, on ARB and and some of the webinars that they that they've been undertaking and will be undertaking in the in the near future, or some of the work that we do, uh, feel free to go to www.awrb.com.au. Fantastic, thank you, David. Thank you, Neil, for your time. Thank you to our audience for joining us again for another uh, run webinar uh, today. Of course, in in collaboration with the NZTA. Uh, we hope you can join us again in future and as promised we will have the presentation material and the recording out to all of you uh, in the not too distant future so please keep an eye on your emails. Thank you once again and we'll see you soon hopefully. Goodbye.